One of the most famous winemaking regions in the world is Piedmont, or as the Italians call it, Piemonte. And one of the wines that comes from that region is called Barolo. I love my Barolos. Next, we have an interview with two brothers, Walter and Silva Daniel, and they make a Barola from a winery called La Stretta. These two brothers make a spectacular wine, and they really got to explain a lot of the nuances of not only Barolo in general, but the different areas of Piedmont where they make Barolo. So enjoy this interview. So, Savio and Moro, thank you for sitting uh, for this conversation. And I'm uh, very impressed I don't need an interpreter. You both speak English. We try. We try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do a very good job. You speak the language of wine, <laughs> which is great. So, tell us about your background uh, as far as the history, how you're in this business. I studied um, enologist in Alba. There is one of the most uh, ancient technological school of Italy. Mm -hmm. And then I start to work uh, in uh, a big company in, in Alba too. And after three years, I start to have a graduation with the University of Turin in Enological. And for your background? For me, it's the same. We are six years different in age. And so Enological School in Alba lasts six years. So he finished and I started. Uh -huh. And uh, I had the same uh, background in, in time of work. And our family uh, transferred us the passion for this, uh, this job because uh, my father and my grandfather uh, worked with vineyards without the property, but they transferred to us this passion. And so this is because we are here producing wine now. So you're the first generation to actually have your own vineyards, but your family worked in the wine industry. Yes, that's correct, uh, because here in Lestrete, um, our family worked with vineyard for generation, so we had this passion. And at the beginning of the 90s here, uh, my wife is original from here, from Novello. They had this uh, whole buildings to restore, and we decided to combine our family, our passion, the family of, of my wife in this project for uh, starts with Lestrette wines here in Novello area. So tell me about uh, this area. So we, in the general sense, we're in Piedmont but then we're in the subregion of Barolo, and this town is called Novello. Yeah. So which commune, you know, we have the communes, which one is this? Novello, in terms of uh, viticultural, in Barolo area is the fifth commune mm -hmm. in production of Nebbiolo for Barolo. Uh, but uh, uh, in the past, uh, there was not uh, a big producer in, uh, in the commune. Mm -hmm. A lot of the grapes are sell from other company that normally they used to uh, produce a classic Barolo mm -hmm. without a, a MGA, the, the mansion for the uh, crew of mm -hmm. the Barolo area. So Novello is important in this way, but uh, we have to work a lot in order to uh, propose the MGA of the, of the commune. And historically is a uh, commune of uh, or Roman origin, mm -hmm. and the, the name is really in Latin, Nove Ville, because the, the Romans uh, built here the uh, houses for the vacation, uh -huh. the Romans that live in Alba, and so it's a, lo a long distance for vacation yeah. at the time, but it's yeah. now incredible that is the, the name of the Novello comes from here. So you produce a variety of wines, uh, La Stretta. What does La Stretta mean? What does that mean? Where does the name come from? <laughs> La Stretta is the name of the hamlet, the small hamlet where we live. Stretta because it's a hamlet that is uh, in uh, the road that leads from La Stretta to the center of Novello, that is really uh, near. It, it, in the past, was really narrow. Mm -hmm. And so narrow in Italian is a stretto, 
Les Treteis because we so are named. And so we just maintain the name of the hamlet, yes. Yeah, and uh, coming in, the roads were very narrow. <laughs> they're, they're still <laughs> yeah, very yeah, narrow. You realize, you realize. <laughs> but now it's really better than in the past. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't imagine the past. <laughs> had a hard time getting the crew here with all their equipment. It was just built yeah. for the classical transport of the time, so yeah. really narrow and not without canyon trucks or uh, big cars. So what is special about, about this area? What is, what is unique about uh, this area where we are as far as wine is concerned? Yes, as my brother said, uh, Novello is classically one of the uh, villages that produces Nebbiolo, but also the other two classical varieties here in Novello, red variety, so Dolcetto and Barbera. Mm -hmm. And we work basically on these three red. So you have all three that you produce? Yes. Yeah. What is curious that Novello is also the historical village that preserved and grown up in the past uh, a white variety mm -hmm. that is uh, really curious, uh, named in Italian Nascetta, in our dialect is Nascetta, is quite more complicated to, to yeah. pronounce, but yeah. we maintain it. And um, we worked a lot uh, for rediscovering this variety that was really classical for the past. So aside of the classical red, we also grow up Nascetta for the production of our white wine. And I, I've never had Nuschetta before, but I, I was able to taste it, and I was I was really shocked. It's a beautiful, beautiful white wine. So I'm, I'm surprised that it went away. That now that you're bringing it back, are you finding that uh, people are uh, are enjoying it? Are, is it becoming popular? Yeah, absolutely. Nuschetta is becoming more and more popular because uh, when we started about uh, 25 years ago, probably there was about. Uh, 2,000 square meters of uh, this variety. And so we and another producer of uh, Novello area, that is Albio Cogno, start to grow another new vineyard and produce this, uh, this wine. And we found that was very interesting because its uh, smell reminds uh, a little bit the Moscato, a little bit the Riesling, mm -hmm. some touch of Sauvignon. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting in this, uh, in this way. But it's more interesting in the taste because it's very dry and uh, it's uh, almost salty, mm -hmm. like the wine that's come from the, the sea. Yeah. And so it's uh, very uh, interesting, the balance between the nose and the mouth. Yes. And it's a wine that is totally different from other wines. So you make that wine, you also make a Barolo. Um, and do you make more than one kind of Barolo? Yeah. When we came here and started the project of uh, Les uh, we wanted, we decided to focus for the reason that my brother explained before, to work on the, for developing the classical terroir of the village. And so, Nascetta in the direction of white wine, but also Barolo. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to move for uh, work with the single vineyard, the crew, the MGA of Novello Village. And so our challenge has been in this direction, to, to produce uh, Barolo that talk about the territory of Novello. And in fact, we produce three different Barolo, three different sing single vineyards, and two of them are based on the area of Novello. So Bergera Pezzole from one side, our, I can consider the most important for us, mm -hmm. and the Corini Pallaretta that are two MGA of the village of Novello. Now what's interesting, we're talking about Barolo, is that uh, I asked you, because uh, you were showing us the 2014, <laughs> I said, how was 2014 uh, you know, for this region? And you said, you know, not good, good for some, not for others. So microclimate plays an important role. Uh, you took me out and you showed me the hillside where that one vineyard is. You could see it from your, your house yeah. here. Um, and you said that in this particular area, it was sort of protected from a bunch of rain and other things, I think. So can you talk about microclimate a little bit and how that affects the wine? In Novello, we have a macroclimate that is very uh, important for Nebbiolo because uh, we are at about uh, 400 and 450 meters of altitude. Mm -hmm. and so it's uh, normally uh, a little bit higher for Nebbiolo, but in the last uh, 15 years it was uh, uh, very important for us to be at this, uh, mm -hmm. at this level because we can preserve uh, also a little bit of acidity, but uh, we reach a great ripe in the in the in the bunches and so we can produce a wine that is uh, strong rich mm -hmm. but also fresh yeah. and is very important for for a barolo in uh, in terms of aging uh, because uh, we need both uh, good amount of tanning but also a small acidity to combine for a long aging 
So other areas, though, in 2014, they were in Barolo, they had more challenges, I guess. Uh, so what was different where they were compared to where your vineyard was? Um, 14 has been a vintage that um, it was important, really, the micro area. So um, a, f a fresh vintage, a lot of rain here and there. And when I say here and there, it, it depends really on the hill. So there has been, but I talk about uh, all the area, about all of those, about Baresco, Roero, the region has been like this. Uh, hill that had a good quantity of rain, many storms, mm -hmm. several periods between July and August, we can say almost every day, right. <laughs> or two, three times a week. And so with an amount of rain, important. Other hills that have not been so touched by storms or by, so finally they had a fresh vintage, but without uh, excess. Right. At the end, we had in our two crew, uh, in one in Novello, Bergera Pezzole, and Bergesa, uh, and Bergesa in Barolo, perfect condition of ripeness, obviously with a fresh style of vintage. In Corini Pallaretta, just for make the example, that is 500 uh, meters distance from uh, Bergera Pezzole, we had more rain and two storms that had a little hail. So Corini Pallaretta has been damaged. For this reason, I say, if it's a, it's a different vintage, right. you have to consider the microclimate of almost each vineyard, each hill at least. Uh, and so, uh, taste the wines at the end. Yeah, in the end. So, it's, you, so you can't make just a general statement, 2014 is good for all of Barolo or bad for all of Barolo. It's really just the, the microclimates in the very yeah, uh, vineyards. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And for this reason, for example, uh, there is a, a very famous producer, uh, Conterno, Giacomo Conterno, mm -hmm. that in 2014 made Monfortino. And so it means that is a good vintage for, uh, for him also. Yes. So it's very different mm -hmm. hill by hill in the vineyards for vineyards. And it, it, what's interesting as I observe the terrain around here is that uh, you know, when I go to other winemaking regions, there's sort of like, you know, there, maybe there's a couple of mountains and a valley through and it's all kind of uniform. Here it's a bunch of hills facing a bunch of different directions. So I could see how it would be very different in the same region, very different by yeah, the producers. This is the richness of the Nebbiolo. <laughs> because Nebbiolo is a, um, a great variety, mm -hmm. but a difficult variety. Yeah. It gives a great results when it's found perfect conditions. It means it's not adaptable. Right. At the end, this difficulty to adapt to the climate means that when it founds the perfect condition, it really reads the terroir. Yeah. So a small changing in vineyards, in hill exposure, it be become a new Barolo. Right. For this reason, you find, and the same I can say for Barbaresco, you find many wines in just one DOCG. Because this difference, hill, vineyards, at the end make really particular condition for each wine, for each hill, each vineyard, yeah. and so you find all this. So Lange is, the Lange area, the Barolo and Barbaresco region are famous for this. The differences in hill became differences in wine. So what other wines do you make besides uh, the Barolo and the white wine that we mentioned also? So what other ones do you have? Uh, we produce the other two typical wine of the, the, of the area, that is uh, Dolcetto. Dolcetto. The DOC is Dolcetto d'Alba mm -hmm. and uh, Barbera, where we made Dol Barbera d'Alba. So let's start with the uh, Dolcetto. What is, what is that wine like? How does that compare to like a Barolo? Yeah, the Dolcetto really is the everyday wine because in the past uh, all the um, wine growers have, uh, in the area normally grow uh, Nebbiolo, mm -hmm. Barbera and normally a small vineyards of Dolcetto to produce the wine for everyday consumption. Mm -hmm. But uh, during the time in the past, uh, it, mm, there was period where the Dolcetto was very famous. For example, in the 60 or 70, a lot of uh, Nebbiolo was uh, uh, changed mm -hmm. in, into Dolcetto because it was uh, very easy to sell the Dolcetto grapes and wine yeah. and very difficult to sell the, the Nebbiolo, especially for the Barolo. And so during the time it changed a, a lot. Now it's very difficult to uh, propose the, the Dolcetto. I think uh, because it's a very particular wine. It's a, a young wine with a great smell, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, rich in uh, taste of red fruit, uh, very fresh, mm -hmm. but uh, it has a tannin that is quite strong. Mm -hmm. And so the taste is very, very particular and very, very different from the nose that, that expect. Mm -hmm. 
And for this reason, it's not so famous in the, especially in foreign market. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past was absolutely uh, very famous in all over the Italy, especially in the big city like Turin, Milan, Rome. It was great market for, for the Dolce. And nowadays it's more or less disappeared. Yeah. Only the small quantity for the firm, the winery that produces small amount of dolcetto and sell very well, but is absolutely not the first wine the, that uh, is uh, grew in uh, in the area. Well, this is very interesting because you talk about everyday wine. So, uh, so great Barolo wines, you know, you shouldn't be drinking those every day. It's like you have a different <laughs> wine that is just for regular meals, that type of thing. And then maybe more special times you, you're going to drink a Barolo. Is that, is that how the culture is here? Uh, normally people expected from the Barolo to have the great wine uh, as it is. And in, in particularly in the past, it was really considered the great wine only for particular occasion. Mm -hmm. Also because in the past probably we had more tannins, mm -hmm. uh, more hard tannins that needed really long time to mm -hmm. be drinkable. And so it was considered the wine to put aside, drink only in particular occasion after 20 years. Now the rapport with the drinking of, of the Barolo started to become more um, usual, I can say every day, mm -hmm. because normally it's also <laughs> higher in price, right, but right. at the end uh, uh, the idea changed. And so it's not necessary to wait uh, several particular uh, red uh, uh, meat dishes for uh, drink dolcetto. You can have a, a, a Barolo. Right. You can have a bottle of Barolo also uh, drinking in, a, in, a, in an evening with, uh, with a friend, yeah. with a good cheese, a seasoned cheese, could be yes. a great emotion. And so in this sense, change the, instead of the Dolcetto that remains considered the, the everyday wine, also if it has, and I can say, combining this aspect of uh, fruity from one side and tannin on the other can really be considered the uh, all meal wine. You can drink with uh, simple dishes, but also with more important, mm -hmm. if you don't want to change the wine to a Nebbiolo, to a Barbera, or if you can, to a Barolo. And where does Barbera fit in now? Because you make a Barbera also. Yeah, yeah. So how does that fit in as far as the experience of Barbera versus, uh, you know, say, a Barolo or some of the other wines? Barbera is a great diffusion in the last period, a great increase in terms of consideration. Mm -hmm. It is the most diffused a variety in the South Piedmont if we consider the three classical ones, so Nebbiolo and Dolcetto. Uh, when you say diffused, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, is it the, you mean the most produced? Uh, more, more in terms of hectares planted in the South Piedmont, okay. it, can, it can not only in South Piedmont but also in Lombardy. So it's, it's in there's, there's more Barbera than there is yes, uh, Nebbiolo. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the reason it, it's a little more adaptable, remaining a not easy to adapt variety, mm -hmm. it is, can be considered the more adaptable. But the results are really different, independence of where you plant, how, mm -hmm. how you lead the wine. So mm -hmm. our experience with the Barbera is for a medium aging wine with a, an important structure. The reason is that, as my brother said before, here we are 420 meters, 450 meters. If you compare, if you consider all the area with the combining with Monforte, with Lamor, so higher. Mm -hmm. A limestone soil, classically Barolo region, limestone soil. If you add also, have also the possibility to uh, have and manage all vineyards, mm -hmm. we have vineyards that are more or less 80 years old. Mm -hmm. And so you can increase the concentration, reduce the production. The classical acidity of the Barbera became, remains as a, a note, as a hand help for maintaining the wine drinkable, and the result is a medium aging and really important wine. So from the experience of uh, Barbera, let's say, versus um, a Barolo or Nebbiolo, um, is Barbera more full body, less about the same? Uh, what's the character of the grape when you compare it? The grapes are quite different. If you uh, compare with Nebbiolo, immediately we, we can see that the Barbera is absolutely more colored, it's very rich in acidity, mm -hmm. and uh, yet it has uh, uh, low tannins. The Nebbiolo vers versus the Nebbiolo that is normally uh, less colored. Also the bunches are normally not so dark, but is uh, red uh, or some, some vintage uh, 
uh, it's possible to find uh, bunches that are pink, not absolutely red, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with uh, a lot of tannins. Tannins that are more soft, uh, more easy to taste in the, in the Nebbiolo than in, uh, in the Barbera. Mm -hmm. It's a small quantity, but normally are more green and a little more aggressive. So when you, when you created Lestretta, you were looking to represent all the different wines that come from the region. Is that why yeah. you have those? You pick those particular ones. Uh, which is the highest produced wine that you make uh, the most bottles of? In, in this moment, we can uh, share the production between the three single vineyards of Barolo and the white Nascetta. Mm -hmm. More or less, uh, eight thousand bottles in both eight nine thousand bottles in both production mm -hmm. and so complexly we have uh, 22 23 thousand bottles produced per year mm -hmm. we have this project is dimensioned for a final 30 thousand bottles and uh, more or less 16 thousand bottles are shared by the white and the barolo crews how much do you sell in italy versus how much do you export uh, well, as, uh, we can uh, say 50 percent as was i think it's the most current uh, dimension of this area, so 50% in, uh, in Italy and 50% exported. It depends also on the wines. For example, Barolo is more exported mm -hmm. and uh, Nascetta is more sell in Italy in this moment. It's fast to increase the outside market, but in this moment is more an Italian wines. And so it, me, average is 50-50, it depends on the wine. If you could have it any way you wanted it, what would that be? Would it still be 50-50? Do you like keeping about half of it home and half of it goes away? Or what would, what would you like it to be? <laughs> I think uh, we, we will try to, um, to reach uh, a balance, a more balance in terms of wine, to sell the, more or less the, the same wine for each market. And uh, uh, for example, in, in, my, uh, uh, in my idea, mm -hmm. I would reach, uh, if it's possible, 15,000 bottles of uh, Barolo, maybe 18. We have the vineyard to reach uh, this, uh, this production uh, and, uh, and sell all, all the wines. <laughs> so what I'm curious about is uh, this, because you, are, you own a vineyard, you produce all these wines. Yeah. How often? For yourself personally, are you drinking your own wines versus how often are you drinking other wines? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. If we have to taste the wine for controlling more or less every day. Yeah. When we are outside, uh, we, we don't drink our wine. It means normally our <laughs> curiosity Obviously, is to taste if we, if just we, with customers. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> if we are at the restaurant with customers, we drink our wine, obviously. <laughs> right, right. But when you have <laughs> a choice, <laughs> yeah. you want to, you're so used to your own wine. It's like uh, musicians don't listen to their own music usually. They yeah. listen to other people's music. <laughs> it's more or less I, the same. I think also it's normal because every time you have to increase and to, to learn something and so yes. taste other producers' wines is important. And so for, for um, arrive at, at home and have more idea to improve your quality. Yeah. So obviously you, you love this region and this is what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what other types of wines do you enjoy from outside of this region that you, that you just personally are your, your areas that you enjoy? Uh, for me, it's very easy. Yeah. Burgundy. Yeah. Burgundy. Uh -huh. I was sure I said that. <laughs> <laughs> for, no, for me, it's the same, but yeah. I, I like also the eastern part of, of Italy, for example. The eastern Trentino, part of Italy. Alto Adige could be an interesting, for me, is in, are interesting. Sorry. Yeah, yeah it's, always, it's always fascinating for me, for the people who live wine every day, <laughs> yeah. you know, what, what they <laughs> develop personally. So that's interesting. Do you guys ever have debates over what wines are the best? Uh, either, oh, yeah, over every which time, wines are the every time. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, every day. But at the end, uh, we have more or less the same idea. Yeah, because uh, it's got a lot of passion, right? As yeah. far as what, what, what can I say is that uh, we're, every time we work together, yeah. when we were baby, and so within this moment, we every time had the opportunity to uh, agree. So yeah. discuss, but agree at the end. And, yeah. so it's, uh, and I think it's very important because the winery is very small. So yes. it's, it's, yeah, it will be... A, very difficult if we aren't agree. What we try to do that everyone bring his own experience, his own idea, his own taste, uh, and the mission remains to express the territory in the wine. Obviously, the way to do this can be different, so you have, we have to discuss about it and also to change it to improve, maintain respect environment, basically, 
respecting the tradition, but also with a see a view to the new opportunity. Yeah. Now, one bottle of wine uh, that you you had me try. You said the bottle had been open for I think five mm. or six days. Yeah. Which is uh, and it tasted perfect. I mean, it was great. So if I come and I buy, let's say, one of your Barolos from one of the three vineyards, and I take this home, what is the right way for me to enjoy it? Um, how long do I leave it open before I start to drink it? Uh, and how would you like me to, to enjoy this wine in my house? I have a joke. You have to drink every, every, uh, right away and drink another one. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, I, I don't think know if that's it. a joke. Yeah. Yeah. No. Ask, ask my producer. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think it's not necessary to open the, the Barolo uh, a long time before. Normally, it's necessary in 10 minutes. 15 minutes, oh, yes. yeah, ah. because I think uh, the, the consumption of Barolo normally is uh, uh, with, uh, with food or with uh, a moment of relax. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the wine has time to develop in the glass. It's yeah. not necessary to open along before. And this might be important to know when you're going out for dinner because you know, some winemakers say, oh, have my wine open for two hours before you drink it. Well, you can't do that in a restaurant. You go, you order a wine. So Barolo would be a good wine for a restaurant because it doesn't need to breathe as long? What we advise is, uh, obviously, if you go in a restaurant and you drink a Barolo, I think also the, the professionality of the owner or the restaurant has to give you the wine in the best condition. So yeah. open two years before could be a good idea, in particular if it's a, a quite older bottle. Yes. But what we advise is, if you are at home, without, uh, you are not in a hurry, so you can enjoy your dinner. Why not do all this experience to open the bottle and start to follow the wine? Because it yes. is really an emotion to, f to find a wine, a, Barolo, a bottle of Barolo, 5, 10, 15 years needs time. But if you follow this developing, it's really an experience. As you see a wine, you realize that you have a wine that increase and improve and show you new things every minute. And so it's really interesting, this experience. I'm glad you said that because uh, I love doing that um, when I have a, a wine, especially one that I've been laying down maybe mm -hmm. 15, 20 years, yeah. is that I want to know what it's like when it first comes out, but then follow it over time. And you said, and I like the word you used, you said the emotion changes, like the feeling of it yeah. changes. Yeah. So is that the whole idea for wine, is, is to experience emotion while you're, when you're experiencing the wine? Oh yes, yes, obviously. You follow the wine and the wine gives you new things to, to appreciate. Yeah. And if you open the bottle and you have the glass that was open two, two hours before, obviously in that moment it's perfect developed, but you don't have several smells that you, you had at the beginning, for example. Yeah. And so, small, step by step, open the wine and uh, new emotion for you, basically. And uh, you increase your, your possibility to taste, uh, to, to receive from a bottle an experience at the end. If I'm somebody, let's say, that was new to wine, because this seems so overwhelming. I mean, so many things to know, so many things to understand, so many regions, so many microclimates. Uh, and so for somebody new, they're saying, oh my God, it's over I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to start. <laughs> what do I drink? <laughs> yeah, what, what do I drink? How am I supposed to experience it? I don't know if I'm doing this right. How, what's the best way for somebody just to get started you know, in, in wine, would you say? This is a problem normally when you travel all over the world with people that never taste the Barolo. They probably knew the, the name Barolo, but don't knew the, the wine. And uh, it's very important for me to explain that uh, this, this wine is something different from the other wine. So you have to start uh, probably with a, a different wine, for example, a Barbera or a Chianti or something younger mm -hmm. and then to arrive at the, the Barolo, like the Brunello or like a Big Burgundy or Big Bordeaux. But Barolo is every day something different. Yeah. And so is an experience that you have day by day. Mm -hmm. Probably the first time that people drink a Barolo is not so satisfied of mm -hmm. this, uh, of this uh, choice because the, the wine is something different from yeah the other experience but after two three times four times uh, it probably become a lower overall at the end the tannins are a point of arriving an arriving point so tannins are something that 
we are uh, used to have tannins, starting right. from the grapes and right. tasting the grapes. And uh, obviously for a, a new drinker, have a wine that in the mouth can have an, an important amount of tannins, can be to make the, the, the mouth dry, etc. Obviously we have to work as producer to make that the, 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 to, to find a way in order to make the tannins softer in the grapes, or high quality in the grape. Right. And also the palate of the drinker, little by little, starts to understand that this tannins is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So to, in your mouth to accompany uh, several kinds of food, great cheese, but also involve the mouth in order to give you an experience. So starting with wine that are softer, fruity, can be a good step, also white. Yeah. Why not with an aceta, for example? Yeah, yeah. Also, an aceta is not so easy if you compare in, uh, yeah. in, the, in the panorama of the white wines. But it remains a, a, a taste that is a little, a little more immediate and can be a good start. Yeah, you know, I, I remember my first Barolo probably mm -hmm. 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I happened to have it with, uh, I ordered a rack, I can remember this day, uh, 25 years ago, I had a rack of lamb. And I just remember, and I had experience with wines, mostly French wines, though, not, you know, not so much uh, Italian, especially Barolo. And I was at a restaurant, and I remember saying, oh, it, but it was so good with the lamb. It was perfect. Yeah. And, and, and it just woke, my, woke myself up to a whole new experience now, saying, oh, this is different. It was definitely very different. And I couldn't, but it was such a, a beautiful wine that went well with that food. So, uh, so I have to imagine that uh, you know, the food you're having with the wine matters a lot for how you're going to experience it. Obviously, the food, uh, Barolo is a wine that uh, is, uh, has to be drunk on the table with important food. Yeah. But in the past, important food was just eat once in a year when you had uh, uh, several kinds of red meat, right. rabbit, savage rabbit, or mm -hmm. maybe one time in, in, in a year, in mm -hmm. the winter, but not every year. In reality, you can combine with also, uh, for example, we have all the panorama of cheese mm. that have offer an, an, an infinity of different sensations. So with a strong cheese, Barolo is perfect. Yes. Uh, obviously, it's perfect combined with the food. For this reason, you had a, a, a great emotion combining the lamb with the yeah. Barolo because the combination, tannins, acidity, complexity, and the fatness of the food are yeah. perfect. So Barolo, long history uh, you know, for Barolo, uh, this region. Um, how has it changed or uh, has it changed much over time as far as how they make Barolos and how they present them? Yeah, the Barolo, the history of Barolo, it's about, uh, uh, started about 200 years ago mm -hmm. in Barolo, uh, where the Marquise uh, uh, Juliette Colbert uh, start to make wine different with the Nebbiolo that they produced in, uh, in Canubi area with uh, a French enologist, Monsieur Dart. And immediately the wine uh, became very famous in uh, all Europe, in the, the court of uh, Europe, because the, at the beginning the, the Barolo was famous uh, um, among the uh, noblesse of, uh, of Europe. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it was very difficult to uh, to drink that kind of Barolo because it was very uh, rich in tanning. It needed a long time uh, to develop and need eight, ten months and ten years in uh, in wood mm -hmm. in order to reach a, a sort of balance and drink and drinkability. Uh, now, probably, that kind of barrel, it was impossible to, to sell, to drink. Uh, and at the end of, uh, uh, at the beginning of Sisti, uh, some producers start to produce Barolo from single vineyard, start to produce uh, Barolo using stainless steel tanks uh, mm -hmm. for the fermentation, and using, try to use the uh, small barrels also for the aging. And so in the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, there was a lot of experimentation in, in the area from producers and like uh, Ceretto, Gaia, Bruno Giacosa, and other names like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, the Barolo changed uh, at the beginning of 80 mm -hmm. with the new producers, that was the, the mythic Barolo boys, mm -hmm. that they changed really the, the production of Barolo using in total the uh, small barrels for aging, short about uh, three, four, 
eight days of uh, maceration for, uh, for the, the grapes. And so the style is totally different from, from the old style. And uh, I think the Barolo now is uh, more balanced mm -hmm. because a lot of producers uh, change the, the style of production from the, the old style, the new style, and there is a balance mm -hmm. between the two styles of production of the wine. Today, there are a lot of producers that restart to, um, aging the wine in, uh, in cask, in big cask, and uh, using a part of aging in uh, small barrels and the second part in uh, a cask, like uh, we do, for example, but there are a, a lot of producers that make wine in this, in this way, and so the wine is more balanced. But the new uh, producer, I think, really, they, they changed the history of Barolo because we discovered with this producer that Nebbiolo has something different from the old Barolo. The old Barolo normally, uh, at the nose, was not perfectly clear, mm -hmm. was uh, normally a little bit reduced. I think in a lot of old Barolo there was also uh, a little bit of Brettanomyces, and so the, the aroma was very different mm -hmm. from the, the Barolo, from modern producer. And uh, with the, the small barrels, we discovered the really potential of the, of the Nebbiolo. And now I think it's possible to find Barolo that are greater than the old producer and the new producer mm -hmm. uh, together. Finally, I think that for a period we had this fight you were a traditional producer if you used big barrels. You were an innovation producer, a new producer, new, new age producer, mm -hmm. if you had the barriques. We had our own experience, our own study. At the end, we convinced that the fruit is not in the two side. Mm -hmm. it is use the wood as an instrument for develop what, what is your, mm, the characters of your terroir, your vineyard and your Nebbiolo at the end. Right. So at the end, every producer has to find what is the best way, because um, the, ch the choice that we have done is to combine these two in different periods of work with different things in different moments of the developing of the mm -hmm. Nebbiolo. Obviously, when you, when you produce a wine with a big barrels, thinking to be a traditional producer, and you have a wine at the end uh, is reduced, is not perfectly clear, uh, you have a defect. At the same time, when you produce a Barolo with new oak and it is oaky, is another defect. So what is important is to mm, choose your own line and develop your own uh, personal uh, history in your vineyards and put this one in the glass, respecting the terroir, the Nebbiolo first in this terroir and so have your own crew. And uh, this is what we are trying to do now. And since 2006, we have with this double step first in small barrels and then in the bigger one, but not for make a choice that can be, can agree everybody. Right. Make a choice that worked with different things in different moments for develop, work with particular aspect of the Nebbiolo. And this is the art of winemaking, right? And, <laughs> and I'm sure the artists have, uh, maybe they fight over this sometimes. This is the right way, that's but the right in, way. In but reality, it's the yeah. art of the nature. So try only yeah. to understand because not do something of uh, artificial, just interpret and try to be a good interpreter of your own grape, what the, poten the potential, the quality that you have in the cluster and bring in the... Really, with the, with the Nebbiolo, that, uh, we need uh, to, uh, to have a protection of the color, especially in the first six, eight months uh, uh, of the life of the wine, because the Nebbiolo is very particular in, in that sense. We have... Uh, a uh, good extraction of color, but we lose a lot of color during the first winter because it's very oxidable. Mm -hmm. And so we need to stabilize this color. The best way is to use the small barrel because in this way we have more oxygen in order to stabilize the color. Stabilize the color just means combine the color with the tannins. And to with, the with tannins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, after this, uh, uh, this period we put in big cask because we have less quantity of oxygen, so we can leave the wine uh, for a longer period in the wood mm -hmm. in order to balance the nose of the wine, mm -hmm. develop the aromas of the Nebbiolo. It really is an art form, yeah. So where does the name uh, Nebbiolo come from? 
Probably the name Nebbiolo comes from the uh, period uh, where in the past uh, the, the, the grapes were picked, normally end of October, beginning of November. And in that period, there was a lot of fog that in Piedmontese is Nebbia. And so Nebbiolo, Nebbia. But uh, for some other, is, uh, the name comes from the Pruins, mm -hmm. that is a, a sort of box that is on the branches and are a little bit gray. And so the, the, they uh, are similar to the, the fog, the, the Nebbia on, nebbia. Uh, on the So on the Nebbia branches. means fog in Italian. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. interesting. And yeah. Nebbiolo is uh, the... Both versions yeah. refers to the fog. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. One, in one version for the climate and the other version for the aspect of the cluster. Well, I want to thank you both very much for uh, sharing all your time and experience with us. I learned a lot now about uh, Nebbiolo and Barolo in general as a, as a region and also a Piedmont as a, as a region. So thank you very much. Thank you to you. It has been a pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. And we have to learn both, all together a lot, a lot of other things. And so yes. <laughs> yes, we do. And it never stops. <laughs> no, no, no. Every day is a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for coming. And oh, also because every vintage is totally different from another. And so well, you know, it's, it, you know I'll, I'll just, with that comment, I'll, I'll just say this, is that it, it's interesting, that keeps it interesting, because it's not the same thing every year. Every, every vintage is a brand new experience for you. Yeah. yeah. Some you, good, some not so good. <laughs> you, uh, you never have the sureness to, that what you have did last year can be okay for this year. And so every year you have to try to be your best for developing the terroir and the characters of the, of the vineyards and of the vines and vintages. That's terrific. So, well, again, thank you very much. Thank you You're for welcome. coming. You're welcome. I love the interaction of these two brothers, how they come together to create this product and what their vision is for it. A lot to learn there. And of course, Barolo is just a beautiful wine experience. Happy to share that with you. All right, so Marco, we just drove through this amazingly beautiful region getting here to this vineyard, uh, La Strette. Is that how you say it? La Strette. La Strette, okay. And uh, so we're in Barolo. Yes. And uh, so understanding Barolo is one winemaking region, uh, but there's all these subdivisions of it. Can you explain all that? Yes. So we can see from, from the map uh, the, the Barolo in itself uh, uh, allow to make, when you make Barolo, you can only make it in this small geographical area. That it, it is about uh, 10 miles by 10 miles. And the whole area is called Piedmont or Piedmonte. We are in the region of Piemonte mm -hmm. in the subdivision as far as winemaking in the Barolo area. Right. And then we can see from the map, uh, very easy to recognize all this color. Right. They define inside of the Barolo the different vineyards. So when you buy a bottle of Barolo, there is always the subdenomination that will bring the wine back to the exact vineyard. Mm -hmm. And so we can see the definition of there are nine different growing areas inside of Barolo and inside those each of the commune has about 10, uh, 9, 10 to 15 single different subdivisions mm -hmm. that can also define the quality or the complexity of, of the wine. So these nine regions of Barolo, uh, they, are, they call them communes, basically, yes. right? In Italian, how they say it? Yes, in Italian we call it comune, comune, and that is the municipality that this area responds to. And then there's the subdivision within each of the communes uh, that are, there's several of them, like I'm looking at the list, these are all subdivisions, all these colors, correct? Exactly. So we are looking at, for example, the commune of La Morra, that is as far as square footed, it's, it's the largest one. Mm -hmm. And inside that, you can find the different subdivision, mm -hmm. um, depending on um, where, where the wine and the, the exact vineyard come from. And then inside of each of those subdivisions, you have individual little vineyards like yes blocks. so it's fascinating because there are there are some areas that are bigger and mm -hmm. some areas that are very very small some point went out of um, so example. for example you can see the the small uh, purple one mm -hmm. it's one of the most famous vineyards in barolo called the canubi and inside that you only have 
maybe six, seven producers that are able to produce Barolo with that specific denomination. So is Canupi one of the communes or it's a sub commune? Camoni is one of the sub uh, division uh -huh. that uh, inside of the commune that you're able to, to produce. So what more. commune is that one? So that is in the commune of Barolo. So and here is where Italian ah, okay, gets confusing. Here is where Italians make a little confusing. So one of the so just to recap, one of the nine communes of Barolo is Barolo. Exactly. And then inside of Barolo you have Canubi. You have exactly. And then so, you have individual six individual exactly. winemakers. So you can see how this gets <laughs> for people. It, it, get, it gets very confusing, and that's why I think uh, reading uh, an Italian wine label can be confusing at the beginning. Yeah. But at the end, when when you get familiar with it, you it's all spelled out. And, and it really gives you a, a pretty exact knowledge as to where this wine is coming from when you read exactly. the label. Exactly, and that's the fascinating part of it. Like everything, the more you get knowledge of something, uh, the better you're going to be able to understand it. Mm -hmm. But in Barolo or some other denominations like Barolo, mm -hmm. you're able to drink a bottle of wine that you can pinpoint it that was made only in, in like one square mile right and that is the only place in the world that you can you can you can drink it from so what are some of the it, let's talk about maybe from the export standpoint say in the United States or other parts of the world what are some of the well-known communes or, or subdivisions of Barolo that people might know? So I think uh, here we, we would want to talk about uh, different styles. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a more like a modern style that is a little bit throw forward, mm -hmm. like producers that came on the market uh, and made a little statement mm -hmm. because Barolo can be a very difficult wine to drink. Right. It's a wine that requires a lot of time because of the acidity and the tannicity. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some producers that in an area where uh, I would call it a grape and Barolo that is a little bit more feminine, mm -hmm. uh, we could name um, one of the, the great, like Vietti, mm -hmm. has introduced uh, these wines on the US market that they are very friendly, they are very open, that right. you, you can drink them right away, where there are other areas in Barolo where they're considered more masculine, mm -hmm. and so they require a lot more time mm -hmm. before the wines are ready, and right. so a little bit more difficult to drink. I know that there are some maybe smaller producers that don't export, but they're very good wines and probably good value as far as the price uh, right here in Barolo. So what, what are some of that you could recommend? Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a, it's a matter of also coming uh, here to the region of Barolo and identifying small restaurants or small shops that can also um, help or direct to very small producers. We are today in a producer that it is, uh, um, uh, as you're describing, they're very, very small. They have uh, three single crews of Barolo that uh, because of the production, they cannot afford to export in many countries. Right. And most of the time you're able to drink them only when you get here. Well, we're looking forward to trying some of those. So that, was, uh, that helps a lot because it, it gets confusing sometimes trying to understand a region and then sub-regions and crews and, and the wine Yes, it's, uh, I always say uh, in life not, nothing comes easy. So <laughs> sometimes you have to do a little bit of work to gain the joy. Yeah. And Italian wine, it's one of those things that it can scare people away at the beginning, mm -hmm. but then once you get to know them and once you get to understand it, it can deliver amazing experiences, yeah. amazing values and, and a lot of joy. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. When I look at uh, wine labels from Italy, uh, sometimes there's a DOC, the letters DOC, sometimes DOCG, sometimes there's nothing there. What, what are those designations? Uh, those are designations to protect either a name, a region, or a way of making wine. Um, mm -hmm. It is definitely uh, the most complicated part of Italian wine, mm -hmm. the wine labels. They're very difficult to decode. They're written in Italian mm -hmm. and nobody knows uh, anything about them. But uh, if uh, we dissect them, uh, we start from the highest denomination uh, that is called the DOCG. That mm -hmm. means denomination of origin control and guaranteed because mm -hmm. there is a body in Italy that controls that all the wineries that have that wine they need to follow a certain direction so the, the end consumer mm -hmm. um, gets that exact product right. um, and so it's like a pyramid effect so the very f there are only around um, 
40 region, 40 areas in Italy that mm -hmm. have the DOCG, and then you go to a much looser area that is the DOC, mm -hmm. uh, where you're still protecting the region, but the area is a little bit uh, bigger. Okay. And then when there is nothing on it, it, sometimes it means that it come from the region, or it comes just uh, making sure that the grape comes from Italy. So if there's nothing on the label, uh, you know, DOC or DOCG, it's just then they don't have the restrictions put on them to make the wine a certain way. Exactly. So, and there is always something on it. It's not as visible sometimes because right. uh, another denomination that is very common is called IGT, mm -hmm. the three letters, and it means uh, that only comes from a certain region. Like you can make a wine in the region of Veneto, mm -hmm. and as long as the grape come from the region of Veneto, uh, you can make that wine with a lot of your ideas, your regulations. You're not obliged to follow uh, certain things uh, to make that wine. Walter, thank you for taking the time to sit and talk with us. Grazie a voi. So Marco is going to do some interpretation here. Um, first of all, tell me about your history in winemaking. What's, what's your background? Allora, la mia azienda è nata con mio nonno nel, nel 1929. So the, the winery started in uh, 1929 with uh, the grandfather and, uh, and then it's been a family affair with his father and now himself and uh, his son stepping in into the winery. They are historically one of the top four Barbaresco producers. E dall'83 ci sono io. Dunque da quattro anni... Finally, four years ago, uh, my son uh, stepped in into being the chairman, the winemaker and uh, the head of the winery. But today he cannot be here because he's in vacation. Oh, boss. Ora però in vacanza. Allora mio nonno... My grandfather started with two vineyards. One in a small area called Cavanna and another one in a small area called Ronchi. Poi quando è subentrato mio padre ha comprato... So then after the first two acquired by my grandfather, when I stepped in into the winery, we purchased uh, two more crews, one uh, the crew of Pora and one uh, the crew of Rio Sondo, and uh, that to complete uh, the four major crews in Barbaresco, and we're still looking to add um, something. So we're still a family-run uh, winery. We have about 10 hectares of uh, vineyards of uh, ownership, and we produce about uh, between 75 and 80,000 bottles. When I talk to other people in the region, they say you're a legend in, uh, in Barbaresco. Uh, what, what is the distinction of Barbaresco? Dunque, beh, il... Beh, non penso di essere una leggenda, questo sì, cerco di fare... So it's, uh, it's humbling to hear legend, uh, I don't feel like a legend, I've been doing this uh, uh, work uh, for 35 years uh, with a lot of passion and if I have to say something about Barbaresco, of course, I would probably say it's the best wine in the world. ...del mondo, questo è normale per... Il nostro è un lavoro in cui se non hai passione non riesci a farlo. This job, if you don't have passion, uh, you, cannot, you cannot continue. Cioè, I nostri, I nostri due barbareschi sono i nostri due crew, uh, Rio Sordo e Pora, pur essendo... So the most beautiful thing that I have to work with is the most uh, two famous uh, crews that we have are only 500 feet apart, but they could not be more different one from another one. Uh, between the soil and the microclimate, uh, they make uh, extremely uh, excellent but different wines. So in uh, Piedmont, in this area, uh, there's uh, your, your uh, Barbaresco's near Barolo, what are, what's the difference in the character of the wines between Barolo and Barbaresco? Yeah, so the two wines are cousins. They're very close to each other. They share a grape of Nebbiolo, 
Probably the, the biggest difference I would say is uh, Barolo could be considered the king wine, the Barbaresco is the queen. Uh, the king, uh, the Barolo has a little bit more technicity. They usually are wines that are a little bit more masculine, where Barbaresco, it's about the finesse. They're a little rounder and a little, I wouldn't want to say sweeter, but more approachable. And that is done by a little bit of the winemaking style, but mostly the different microclimate and the different uh, terroir. Queste differenze vanno un po' ad assottigliarsi. So it's amazing is that uh, similar region, same grape that they grow, but very different as far as the characters, um, you know, from uh, winemaker to winemaker and uh, region to region, like Barolo Barbaresco. Uh, you said something very interesting about um, you have to have passion. How does the passion that the winemaker feels, how does that show up in the bottle and the experience for the person who drinks it? Ma eh, la passione non si vede solo all'interno di una bottiglia, la passione inizia in inverno. So it's hard to define, but the beautiful and the passion that we put in starts in the winter when uh, we have to cut the vineyard, set them up uh, for the new fruit. And then uh, in April and uh, in the summer when we see the bunches and the grape uh, starting to take shape, it is uh, all the way to after three years that we see it in the bottle, uh, we see a progression, we see uh, a lifelong, and it's very fun to taste uh, the wines throughout the process. Quasi un'energia al vino. The idea of a family-owned vineyard versus maybe a bigger, more corporate vineyard is that, that passion give uh, a little bit of distinction for the wine for the smaller family vineyard as compared to a big corporate one? Ma probabilmente per il consumatore lo senti Yes, from experience because we have uh, to handle all the aspects of the winemaking uh, from uh, the producing, the enology side, the shipping, and the hospitality and, and all, we feel like that when we taste our wines with consumers, we are able to express that. And um, there is a, where a big commercial winery sometimes cannot do that. He's holding a bottle in his hand of one of his wines. Uh, so if I were to buy that wine and take it home, how does he think uh, I should enjoy it? What is the right way for me to enjoy his wine? Yeah, so I'm holding in my hand the Barbaresco Reserva Rio Sordo 2016 that uh, it was considered probably the best vintage in the last 20 years. So it's an important wine with an important vintage that I will recommend if you take it home to hold it in your cellar for a few years because it needs a little bit more time. And then when you open it, this is a more like a meditation wine and uh, it needs to be lived. Uh, so it needs to be smelled, it needs to be looked at, it needs to be tasted with time. So it's important that the other senses, not just taste, but the other senses are, are also part of the experience of the wine. Yes, so when you taste it and open it, you should uh, remember all the views and all the smells and all the experiences that you had here in the Lange, and that will make uh, this bottle special. Should I also remember his grandfather and who started all this? Sì, è stato molto importante perché mi hanno mi hanno dato degli insegnamenti che nessuno Yes, is, uh, for me is very important. Uh, the grandfather taught me something that no school, no book will ever teach me. Uh, I remember when I was young going through the vineyards and of course I was a kid and I was playing, but I remember my grandfather telling me that this is a job that will you will never finish to learn. E mi diceva sempre che in ogni caso io dovevo essere and uh, his uh, teaching was uh, also to any part of what there is to do in the winery, even uh, to the uh, brooming, uh, the, the cellar, to sweeping, to cleaning. And in fact, after I uh, got my enology degree for the first uh, year, uh, my grandfather only allowed me to clean the winery and not touch it. <laughs> so uh, for his own son, did he do the same? Hai fatto la stessa cosa per tuo figlio? E ho fatto, sto facendo la stessa cosa per mio figlio e non è, e come, e come me non è contentissimo. <laughs> yes, I'm doing the same thing with my son <laughs> and he's not very happy with me. <laughs> so, uh, what did it feel like when his uh, son decided that he wanted to come into the business? Mi ha fatto sicuramente piacere perché il lavoro... 
yeah, I'm extremely happy not only for keeping the tradition and, and taking the winery to the fourth generation, uh, but also because uh, uh, even though he's, uh, he's an engineer by trade, uh, now uh, he showed me the passion and I'm able to pass it completely to him. So the word passion keeps coming up, and that, is that the key ingredient for a winemaker uh, to have, and a, a family of winemakers to have, is that passion? Yes, uh, this is uh, not only for me, it's uh, this area that has uh, this characteristic uh, uh, passed from traditions. Uh, let's not forget that this is a, was historically a very poor area. Uh, so without uh, the passion and uh, the motivation, this was not possible. And I want to remember the writing of a famous uh, local writer, Pavese, that always said that your land, uh, you need to carry it wherever you go, because the moment that you come back, it still be with you. You spoke about the, the land that uh, you take it with you, you know, uh, develop it well. Uh, for people now, you send your wines to many places for people to enjoy that can never come here. Uh, so how can they, in their mind, try to come here by enjoying your wine? Ma queste bottiglie devono portare l'atmosfera di Langa. Yeah, so these bottles, they first of all, they have to bring uh, the flavors of the Langa. The, it's definitely one of the best places in the world uh, to produce wine, uh, vocated to the vineyards and uh, the traditions and the passion of the people that uh, are working here. So not only they have to bring uh, the wine, but it's uh, an enogastronomic experience, uh, starting with a very poor, very simple, but in my opinion, one of the best uh, cuisines in the world that this land has to offer. And it's like uh, Barolo and Barbaresco and like the truffles uh, from Alba, nobody can imitate. So they are the best in the world. Well, thank you for sharing your passion uh, with us and uh, bringing this all to life. And uh, I very much appreciate uh, what you, the work that you do and the passion that you put into it. Grazie a voi. Grazie a voi per essere venuti in Langa. Grazie. Thank you for being here in the Langa region. So what do you think? A nice Barbaresco tonight? I bet you want one after that interview. I certainly did. <laughs> anyway, really excited to share that with you. Thanks for watching it. I see many times on uh, wine lists uh, Barbarescos. So what, what's a Barbaresco? A Barbaresco is a wine from Piemonte. Mm -hmm. It's made with 100% Nebbiolo. And if I can use uh, the example, uh, Barbaresco is uh, the prince and Barolo is the king. Mm -hmm. uh, usually Barbaresco are identified as uh, gentler, softer versions of uh, Nebbiolo. Uh, they come from an area that uh, it's a, a less hilly, and so they're more feminine, more approachable. Uh, in fact, Barbaresco are usually released uh, a little bit earlier than Barolos and tend to be a little bit more uh, feminine, uh, more enjoyable. You could drink them younger? You can drink them a lot younger, and um, they have a very soft and gentle version of what Nebbiolo is. And when do you typically like to serve a Barbaresco? Barbaresco has a variety of uh, uh, food for me that can be, can be good because it can be uh, all the way from pasta with even high acidity because mm -hmm. the acidity in Barbaresco takes out the sweetness out of Nebbiolo mm -hmm. uh, or they're extremely good uh, for high fat dishes. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can go from really from uh, pasta all the way to, to a second course and it's pretty versatile. Next up, we have Paolo Manzoni, and he makes a beautiful Barolo. As a matter of fact, after we did this interview and this walkthrough with him, we all went out to dinner together, and he brought a big, big bottle of an aged Barolo from his vineyard, and it was otherworldly. It was so beautiful. Also, they served some special pasta that night that everybody was like, oh my God, I've never had a pasta like this before. And it was something that was regional, special to that region. This is what it's all about. You're gonna learn from Paolo Manzoni about Barolo, about the making of Barolo wine. You're gonna have an experience with it. And when you match that to the right food, boy, is life good. Check out this interview.
Paolo, thank you for inviting us here. It's yes. a very beautiful place you have. Thank you. It's very, very pleasure for me. <laughs> so we're in Barolo. Yeah. Uh, but where in Barolo are we? Exactly. The area is a Barolo Meriame, is a crew of, uh, of Barolo area. And the village is village of Serra Lunga d'Alba. It's one of the historical village of uh, production of Barolo. Is uh, Serra Lunga in need like uh, long uh, uh, protection area uh -huh. uh, for the you have a, a long area like a, sm a small ears very long and thin and this in this uh, area you have a lot of grand cru of barolo wines and this is the in the heart of the area of barolo mm -hmm. for the practically around to Serralunga is uh, 11 small village village of barolo is just 11 very very small every village is only four or five hundred people each uh -huh. it's really really small and not possible to compare with other uh, area or a big city right. uh, in Italy. This is the special character of uh, the, the area. And behind this, uh, so I can see it's very hilly here. Yes. A lot of hills. So uh, so this is all uh, part of the area that you're in. It's the same designation here? Exactly, yeah. exactly. For the practically, is a very, very interesting for the, in the 11 village, is a uh, hole is in the hills, mm. not too higher, not too low. Right. Is uh, the, the average of the hills is be between 300 and 400 meters, the yes. level of the sea. And the practically, for example, is uh, possible to look Every small village is a uh, small hills. In the top, if in the hills, mm. you have a uh, you uh, village, a, yeah. a, a, a village with a, a normally is a castle uh -huh. or a church, and around the castle of the church is a small uh, quantity of, of houses. The old house of the people live for uh, for go in the vineyard. But uh, uh, in the in the same time, the, with uh, the medieval period, is developing the same the small farm in the hills, yes. and uh, around to the farm is the the vineyard of the property. But in any case, this area is very easy to compare to Burgundy area for this small farm. It's not big like Tuscany. Tuscany is very easy to compare to to Bordeaux, Bordeaux area, yeah. and the uh, Piedmont area is very easy to compare to Burgundy area yeah. for the small property, small vineyard. For example, our vineyard in Barolo is 4.5 hectares, yes. very, very small. So uh, your family, when you started here, I guess, uh, started as farmers, just uh, farming grapes, right? Exactly. Not making wine. Exactly, exactly. It's a very, very special history for the my family and the family of my wife is a practically five generation. Is not really the wine producer, but is a grape grower. Right. Gr grow the grapes and uh, and uh, produce grape and sell the grapes to the traditional seller, old historical seller, or to the cooperative seller. And uh, my father is starting uh, 50 years ago to produce a little quantity of wine for the local market. Right. And uh, I'm studying with winemaker school and uh, and the 20 years ago now is uh, rebuilt the, the two property, the, my fa the family property, and uh, little by little developing the business of the wine. And now Barolo is uh, very famous wine all yes. over the world. And the total production is around 200,000 bottles. Yeah. And the export uh, the wine in uh, 30 countries, 90% in 30 countries all over the world. From here, so 90% you, so you export from exactly. here to other countries. <laughs> exactly. And it's interesting, uh, your, your wines are very, you know, your Barolos for the quality, very high quality Barolo you get here. Yes. Um, and uh, what's interesting though is what you said, because this area is breathtaking, it's so beautiful. When we came into this area, I looked around and I just could not believe how beautiful it was. And as you said, you see these little villages and a castle, a church, what have you. But, uh, and it looks very wealthy now. Yes. But you said it used to be very, very poor up until maybe uh, 20, 30 years ago. Exactly, yeah. exactly. For the practically after the Second Mondial War, this area is, is the name Barolo is so famous, but uh, the, the business is very low for the yeah. after the Mondial War. It's no business, not... Uh, mm -hmm. And the developing after the Mondial War, little by little, to uh, restart uh, the put uh, the big name of Barolo in yeah. the world. Yeah. And But really, the, the explosion of the name Barolo is uh, practically 
40, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, little by little, in very, very quickly time, the, the name Barolo, the famous name Barolo, is uh, make very, very strong yes. uh, uh, name all over the world. Mm -hmm. And now practically not only my wine, but uh, all of the area, I hope uh, uh, 70, 80 percent, 75, 80 percent of the wine uh, uh, export all over the yeah. world. Uh, There's a high demand for Barolo now yeah. <laughs> because it's a beautiful, very unique wine. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, is uh, really one of the uh, re uh, real reasons that the wine Barolo is so famous in the world is uh, for the grapes of Barolo is Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo. Mm -hmm. ne Nebbiolo is a very strange name for the Nebbiolo is the like fog. Fog. It's the grape of the fog. For the in the past, the maturation of Nebbiolo is a very good maturation. At the moment, start the fog in the right. vineyard yes. in the end of October. No? Mm -hmm. And uh, practically the Nebbiolo name with uh, Barolo Barolo name is developing very very good. And uh, and uh, is uh, is uh, Nebbiolo is a terroir grape. Yes. Like uh, the same idea about uh, Burgundy area. Pinot you have Noir. A Pinot Noir is terroir grape. Right. Each village village is uh, make a little different yes. uh, wine. In this area is exactly the same. Every small vineyard, every area or every village and in the village you have some uh, crew or some uh, uh, parcel of uh, with very special microclimate uh -huh. and uh, developing a little different character uh, wine and this is the reason is uh, is one name Barolo but really is uh, more than 100 expression yes. of Barolo wine and and I'm looking forward you'll give us a tour now yes. I'm looking forward because you you showed one small area and say in this one small area there's four or five micro uh, climates yes right in here and you bottle five different wines from uh, it yes exactly yeah, exactly yeah. Uh, this is very very interesting for the the same in our area is uh, like uh, uh, our vineyard is uh, 4.5 hectares is like a natural amphitheater mm -hmm. but in the same place you have uh, the altitude is between 350 and 380 meters uh -huh. in altitude and in uh, 10 meters is uh, change a little bit the characteristic of microclimate oh, yeah. it change a little bit the soil and the same change exposition no? for the southwest right. uh, more southwest uh, southeast uh, or uh, full south yeah. and uh, practically is a uh, change the the quantity of the sun it change the quantity of the water is in the soil and it makes a big difference in the in the wine and when it comes makes out. big difference yeah. in the wine it's incredible no it's looking quite strange but really yeah. is the characteristic and the soil in the same time is a clay and calcareous soil uh -huh. is perfect clay and, you know, it's clay and calcareous and, calcareous. and they make a very very good uh, blend of soil yes. <laughs> for this uh, is a uh, Clay is uh, bring the water and calcareous is a, a very good micro porosity in mm. the soil so. is no stone, no stone. and the practically the the same in, in case you have a only big rain in the spring mm. or uh, uh, snow in the winter yes. is all of the water 90 percent 100 percent of the water go to the soil little by little and they make a reserve water for for the trees for the vineyard nice. and the same same in the summer is uh, not so much uh, rain or uh, is uh, the soil is uh, keep uh, the natural uh, quantity of water for the roots and uh, is developing uh, very well the same in august sometime is looking very dry like like uh, at the moment mm -hmm. but the leaves is very green for yes. the the ro roots bring some quantity of water in the soil and they're developing a perfect uh, uh, vegetation in the yes so uh, can you give us a tour yes absolutely thank you <laughs> All the parts of the house, mm -hmm. the traditional wall. Yeah. You said this, this house is 300 years old? Yeah, 300 years old. Wow. It's, uh, wow. It's it's practically <laughs> is, uh, the family mm -hmm. is a constructed part, first part of the house in right. this part. Yes. And this is, uh, is uh, in the past, is the old. Uh, uh, cellar of the family. This was right here. Yes. Now exactly. you made it the tasting room. Yes, yes. Now it's tasting room. Mm -hmm. But uh, one time is uh, the the cellar of the family, but only the cellar like for like the private uh, cellar yeah, private for the cellar family. For family for oh. the, is a produce only a little quantity of uh, Nebbiolo or a little Barbera and Dolcetto just for the drinking during the year. Uh. And this is uh, very very special for this. Uh, no 
no uh, make wine for for business but yeah. make wine for, for family, for family yeah. and sometimes is uh, the part of uh, the the grapes uh, and sometimes it's not the best grapes right. for they uh, sometimes sell the uh, the best why would the, the family not keep the good grapes for themselves they want to for sell the, it for the money for the, yeah. the, the this area is so poor and yeah. they need to bring a little more money yes. for for uh, for uh, so the they, for for sell yeah. and and they keep uh, sometimes not the best wine and they're drinking every day yeah. for the one time the 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 wine in this area is uh, not like now is uh, the best product for uh, for a special occasion right. eh? the the wine is a wine is a part of the food yes. for these uh, people yeah. it's a uh, bread uh. and a little uh, meat huh? or cheese but wine is one part very important part of the food for the one time some people drink wine for nutrients yes. so for, and drink wine every day and uh, drinking uh, and lunch. And they lived a long time. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> my, my grandmother is, uh, is a little crazy history for that. My grandmother is, uh, is uh, dead, 102 years old. 102? Yes. <laughs> so wine's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the most important thing is at 25 years old, stop to drinking water. Stop in, drinking water? Exactly. In your life, drinking only red wine. At not Barolo, but only Dolcetto wine, the, the more basically table <laughs> one. <laughs> I can't, I can't recommend that as a yes, doctor. But, but, uh, and that, the, and crazy. the, and the ninety years old, yeah. uh, uh, the, he have the first problem for a little thrombosis, a little uh, headache problem. A ninety years old, eh? uh, uh, very uh, old, and the, and the doctor coming the first time a ninety years old, and uh, looking the the grandmother and the, and the play. Oh, it's not so big problem. You need to bring some uh, medicaments, me medicine, and uh, my mother is looking. Yes, it's possible for this. The first time the grandmother ninety years old, the first time she has yeah, any yeah, medicine. Yes, yes, wow. yes. The medicine, and there is a, the the unique problem is to bring medicine with. Uh, uh, is not drinking water, and this is the problem. No? And the, <laughs> and the, Take with wine. Yeah, and, and the doctor uh, is uh, stay 10 minutes like this, and they're looking, oh, in case not drinking water, bring the medicine with wine, red wine, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and they uh, bring the first medicine, and after uh, one week, eight and days are uh, okay, yeah. and, and uh, is live another 12 years, <laughs> no problem. Wow, well, that's crazy. <laughs> Can you show me what we have back here? Exactly. Okay. This is the part of uh, cellar. Is a uh, go directly to the part of uh, aging room. Is uh -huh. an interesting part for aging. And this is uh, have a two different uh, system to aging wine. Mm -hmm. and this is the. Uh, it's not barrique. This is Burgundy barrel. So, so the Burgundy. Burgundy from barrel. Burgundy France. Yes. A medium toast. Yeah, it's like very a light low medium toast. toast. Yeah, yeah. Medium but low, low toast. Yeah. And this is uh, 350 liters. Three, okay. For, for the is uh, is very interesting. For you have a little more volume in wine. Uh -huh. And the less uh, and uh, less surface in in oak. Yes. And the evolution of wine is so quick, but not so much quick. And, and, and how long do you leave them in the small barrels? And this is stay 26 months. 26 it's, months. It's That's a, a one part uh, is stay 26 months uh, in in uh, Burgundy barrel, mm -hmm. and uh, another part uh, normally is 70 and 30, is stay in the big barrel. Uh, we'll but go look at those over yes, here. Yes, exactly. And the big barrel mm -hmm. is um, different, and uh, this part is a uh, more old part for aging wine. This is. Uh, Barolo, 100% Barolo, and this is a barrel, uh, Slavonian oak, mm -hmm. uh, 3,000 liters each. Three, so it's 4,000 bottles? Yeah, 4,000 bottles. Wow. This is uh, very, very interesting for the practically. Uh, in this barrel, the wine uh, uh, not uh, evolving too fast. Yes. It's a less, uh, slow, more slowly than, uh, than the barrel. But uh, is uh, keep uh, your natural character and not change uh, so much. Is uh, maintain your uh, natural. So it's a more natural uh, character as compared to when you try to do things with it in smaller bottles. Yes. So how long is it in here? And this is stayed the same, twenty six months. Oh, wow. So yes. twenty six and twenty six. Twenty six. Fifty two months. And twenty six in the barrel. Part twenty six in the barrel yeah. and part twenty six. Same wine, same in different no. way. For the practically. 
in the big barrel, the wine aging uh, uh, more, more slowly yes. and they keep your traditional character. And tannin is so strong and yeah. uh, dry. Yes. In the small barrel, the evolution is a little more soft, okay. a little more elegant. Yes. And the final is very good to have a 70%, 80% of big barrel for the sand, the character of the soil, the character of the grape. Right. And 30% of uh, the barrel, uh, French barrel, for the sand more elegant. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometime for the final customer, uh, in case is 100% big barrel, the wine is, uh, the younger Barolo, wow. after four years, is too young and too dry, wow. too strong. Yes, yes. With uh, the blend a little bit, uh, the same wine, uh, same basically wine with, uh, uh, part aging in the small barrel and part aging in the big barrel, mm -hmm. the final perception of the wine is more elegant, nice. a little more soft, yes. with a strong character, but uh, more easier. For the one time, the people uh, keep the Barolo for 10, 15, 20 years, at the same the restaurant. Right, right. But now the, the time is more uh, fast for, yeah. uh, for yeah. drinking. Yes. And the, practically the people uh, buy the wine after five, six years yeah. and uh, start to drink it yes. too, a little too fast. Yeah. But it's not possible to keep the wine uh, for like, like uh, 100 years ago. Yeah. Is, uh, keep the wine 20, 30, 40, but Barolo, more is old in the good vintage and more the quality is, yeah. uh, is very, very good. And this is uh, fantastic for the, is, uh, is uh, the maturation of Barolo is uh, like a life of the people. It's uh, very, very slowly, very, very uh, strong and the change. Yes. Like people is born to the <laughs> children growing yeah. and the Barolo is exactly the so same. It develops, it develops time. Yeah. in the, develops in character, develops in the, in the structure, in the body, mm. in all of the face. Is the, all of the character is, the, is evolving. And the final, the, after 10, 12 years, the wine is uh, in very incredible uh, yeah. sensation. It's yeah, really it's developing uh, in a spectacular way. Yeah. It's, uh, fantastic. Nice. But, <laughs> Where do we go from here? Yeah, uh, now is the go to the uh, bottling line and to the, the storage of the, the bottle. The storage, okay, yeah. so let's okay. go this way. Yeah. Okay. This is the, another part is a traditional part for fermentation room. Is, uh, in this part mm -hmm. is only uh, the time of the fermentation. Okay. But uh, is a pick up the grapes around to, depend of the years, 10 or 15 October. Right. And uh, is a pick up the grapes by hand mm -hmm. and the control the grapes in the... So all your grapes are picked by hand? They're by hand, 100%. Hand hand and uh, two people, each a small basket, 20 kilo. Wow. Is, is uh, looking uh, face, uh, grape by grape. So and they, they, they're the basket. hand selecting the grapes? Yeah, selected in case uh, it's a very bad grape. It's not pick yeah. up, it's a put down. And uh, transport the, the small basket, 20 mm -hmm. kilo, mm -hmm. directly here. And they have a one uh, special machine, uh, is put the basket in the tarn table. Right. And they reselected 100% of the grapes. For the in case one small part is damaged or uh, is a cut a small part, mm -hmm. after is a destimed and, and they put in the tank. This is have a, the vineyard that are divided in five, the, all of the There's vineyard is five four sections. Five, <laughs> in five sections. Mm -hmm. And the practically each tank uh, is uh, uh, put uh, one parcel of the vineyard. So they ferment from their one area that they ferment. Exactly. So, so you say they, they bring them in, they hand select, they destem, take the, the stems stem, off, and, and then they put they go it in, in the, the, in the tank for, yeah. fermentation. for fermentation. But practically, you have, uh, uh, for example, two parts uh, of old vineyard, 70 years old, yeah. and uh, three parts of uh, normal vineyard. vineyard is around to the average is 25 years old but it's three different parcel and the device all of the parcel in each part of the tank. And the same after the fermentation, it keep the wine separate and they put in the barrel separate. But uh, the fermentation is a very, very interesting moment mm -hmm. for the fermentation is starting uh, very normally low temperature mm -hmm. is uh, looking some time to pick up the grapes uh, only in the morning in right. case it's too hot and uh, pick up the grapes around to 18, 20 degrees uh -huh. and uh, put in the, the cellar crash and uh, 
the temperature growing alone, uh, little by little, mm -hmm. and the practically with uh, 20 degrees is uh, the, the fermentation uh, period is around to 18, 20 days. Yes. Uh, depend of the years. And the temperature growing very, very slowly. And they grow in the 20 degrees to 20... 6, 27 degrees. While they're fermenting? Yeah, and okay. the fermentation. Mm -hmm. And the return uh, after uh, 12 days, 12, it, 10, it 12 days, cooler. it, it, it starts to cool it, is, uh, is uh, continue the, mat the maturation yes. after the fermentation, yes. another uh, three, four days, yeah. and the finish the fermentation. Uh, it's very, very important for the, uh, in the regular years, it's not used uh, yeast. It's no not yeast. by yeast, no yeast. Is the natural yeast of the vineyard. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it's the natural yeast from the vineyards. And that the, it, and, and, they, and they make the process. Now you said you're also you're growing your grapes organically. You don't, yeah, you don't yeah. spray. Is yeah. uh, is uh, this process is a uh, name in Piedmont. You have a very very special system to to grow the grapes. The name is Green Experience. Green Experience. Green Experience, yeah. like uh, ec sustainable and and organic. Sustainable in, organic. Organic yeah. in the same way. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very, very interesting for them not to use any special pesticide. Right. Uh, it's uh, like systemic pesticide right. go inside. Yes. It's a uh, protect only for uh, copper and sulfur. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, after, it's uh, not to use a uh, system to cut the grass by chemical. It's just uh, cut yeah. the grass by, by a small machine or by hand. Yeah. And, uh, oh, so that there's no gasoline. Yeah, when you're yeah, cutting not the, yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, not use uh, any uh, chemical fertilizer. Yeah, but uh, is, uh, is change the chemical character of the the soil. Yeah. You need to use organic uh, every one two years, depend of the the, the humidity. Mm -hmm. Use uh, some organic uh, fertilizer, yeah. and uh, is keep in natural way for the. It's very, very important to keep your natural ambience. So your now you have the pure, the pure uh, experience of the wine in a glass, nothing yeah. interfering. Exactly. With it. Yeah. This yeah. is our uh, idea for the future, for the maintain more natural wine uh, are possible. And yes. this is uh, very interesting for the, this is uh, make very special character in the, in the vintage. Yes. Every vintage is different for the, Every vintage you have a different weather, different uh, humidity, yeah. different uh, so climate. So the amount of yield is different every vintage too, right? Yes, how, yes how for the de developing in different way. For example, some years the fermentation is uh, quite quickly. Yes. Uh, in one week mm -hmm. the fermentation is quite finished. Some years it's starting very slowly, it's a uh, brink uh, two, three days for right. start. Yes. And there is, a, is a 10, 11 days mm -hmm. for fermentation and uh, I finish the fermentation and, and the time is, the, the, the time of maturation is quite the same, it's yeah. changed one, two days, but the, the, the system, uh, the grapes uh, is uh, transformed yeah. in wine is different. Yes. For the average years, the, the weather condition change the characteristic of the yeast, yeah. the natural yeast. Natu yeah. And, and this is, the, is a make a, a so it's different it's character. It's exciting every year you know, how the character might show up. Yes, you never Fantastic. know. It's like having a child, right? You yeah. don't know how, how are they going to grow up? I don't exactly. know. <laughs> exactly. It's, a, it's incredible. Yeah. Every year is, is a need to work in, in the natural way in a little different work for the you need to uh, change the time of harvest yes. or harvest uh, the, the grape a little more cold. Mm. Uh, and every year you have a, a little different character yeah. in, the, in the work and uh, finally you have a big difference in the wine. And yes. uh, this is uh, great. The, the natural way. So what's back here? You have storage back here? Yes. Uh, look at that? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is a, more, a little more new cellar for his uh, construct uh, 20 years ago, practically. 20 years? Ago. Yes, yeah. and this is um, a cellar for, um, for the storage of the bottle. For the, it's very important, more and more. One time, the, the aging room is the most important. Right. For the, in the aging room, it's developing the first character of the wine right. and developing the character. But... Now, more and more, the people are very interesting to developing the character in the bottle. Uh -huh. For the, uh, in the bottle, you have a, a more small change, yeah. but in the same time, the change is, uh, is uh, very, very important for this uh, 
uh, is uh, developing a very small characteristic, is uh, make a, a high definition in the wine. So you store it more in the bottle now? Uh, exactly. No, the, the most part of the storage is in the, in the, sure, in the barrels, in, in the barrels 26 months. But uh, the most part of the cellar uh, is the blending mm -hmm. after the storage in the barrel mm -hmm. and the bottling and, mm -hmm. and uh, start to, to go to the market. Now you have big storage here in this yes. room, no. and then I see, a little, I see one that's locked up behind the crate, so what's, <laughs> what's the difference? This is a big difference for that. This is the uh, normal storage of the bottle, mm -hmm. and uh, at the moment bottling Barolo wines, yeah. the wine stay one year in the big box, 600 bottle, uh -huh. and the store for one year in the horizontal position, mm -hmm. but 100% of the production, right. and 100% of Barolo, uh, one year aging in the bottle, mm -hmm. uh, six months for Nebbiolo d'Alba, uh, four or five months for Barbera, two, three months for Dolcetto. Every wine, he have a, a, a different life in, uh, the bottle, in the bottle, first to go to the market. Before you release it. Yes. And what's here? And this is uh, my special uh, idea the, for yeah. the, to make one uh, special close part of the cellar for different uh, kind of uh, work. The first is uh, keep uh, some manium, mm -hmm. manium bottle, three liter bottle, mm -hmm. or all the part, uh, all the bottle of Barolo. Yes. Yeah, but not all uh, is uh, keep normally 600, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 400, 600 bottle each year of uh, Barolo Mariame, mm -hmm. the Grand Cru. And uh, you have another wine, very special blend, the name is uh, Louis, is uh, made with old vineyard, of uh, uh, Nebbiolo, Barbera, and Dolcetto. It's a blend. A blend? So can you show me in here? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> okay and this is uh, the special part of the cellar for the is a special room, yes. it's a close. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this practically is uh, uh, keep some special wine for, uh, for aging more time. Okay. I'm looking to keep the most part uh, of, of wine are possible. Yes. In, unfortunately, not not big volume, but uh, normally looking behind uh, 400 and 600 bottle each vintage. Oh, each vintage. So you keep that many in yeah. here. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Many here. Uh, you don't want to sell those. Yeah. No. It's so very very slowly. Yes. Or or uh, testing very slowly. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. is uh, is the most part is not really for sold, but for organize some special testing yes. all over the world or vertical testing yeah. for the practically yeah. is a here by here is very interesting to look in the evolution of the wine in yeah. the time, especially Barolo is fantastic in. 10, 12 years old. Yes. And uh, this is the reason is very interesting uh, in the future more and more organize some vertical testing mm -hmm. and testing the wine after six, seven years yes. to, to 10, 12 years. Yeah. But there is, uh, is a big change in the wine. And uh, every year, the especially Barolo wine, change your uh, little face, no? Is uh, change your uh, uh, explosion of, yeah. of, of flower, fruit, uh, yeah. For uh, old, for a um, uh, long uh, after tasting uh, character is mm -hmm. is uh, change a lot. Now, do you keep your blend, uh, the special blend you keep here also? Uh, exactly, show and, me where uh, that and is. Uh, yeah. this is another special part of the the room. For yeah. in this part uh, is aging our uh, special blend. For the in ninety percent of uh, the wine of Piemonte mm -hmm. is not blend. Right. Is uh, one wine, one grapes. Dolcetto, right. Barbera, Nebbiolo, right. and Barolo is 100% Nebbiolo wine, Nebbiolo grapes. Right. But uh, in 10 years ago, I decided to, uh, why I not make my special blend? Right. And, uh, and I'm looking, uh, this is, uh, the, the idea is for the, uh, bring some old vineyard mm -hmm. from Cinio. Mm -hmm. It's old vineyard of Nebbiolo, yeah. old vineyard, 50 years old. So you're taking the three main red grapes. Yes, right? the, 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 the local, yeah, the local. The Barbera and, uh, and, and the Nebbiolo. 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 And you blend them together. And, uh, but but uh, what is, it's called Luvi? Louis is a nickname of my wife. Ah. It's a Louis Zella, and I explain every day Louis. And this is, a, is the idea is a Louis buy the, the painting. Yes. Every year she buy a new painting. Oh, every year she buys a new painting, yeah. and it's a different and painting the, on the label. Exactly. Ah, exactly. Yeah. Every year she put the, the painting on the label. And the, and the, but the, the, the blend is not blend for the grapes. 
Right. It's a blend after the aging in oak, after the aging in so the barrel. So you taste it and then blend it? Exactly. Yeah. After the aging, is a testing different barrel. Mm. And every year make different blend with different uh, average of, of uh, mm -hmm. wine and uh, different volume. For the one year, for example, is uh, looking to make a little more quantity of bottle for the quality mm -hmm. is uh, very, very good. Some years you need, need more selection in the yes, wine yes. and uh, it reduce uh, the, the bottle. Sometimes it produce two, 3,000 bottles. Yeah. And some years produce five, 6,000 ah, bottles. Yes. Every year is different. And uh, practically, this is, uh, for example, in 2015, mm -hmm. this is the painting from the painter of uh, La Morra uh -huh. village and the Lamora painting. And the, in the 2015, I produced 3,940 bottles. Every bottle, you have the signature of the painter the, yeah. and the, my so signature. So that's the artist and that's your signature uh, together. Exactly. At the end of the bottle. Nice. And the bottle. And uh, it's a produced totally 3,940 mm -hmm. bottles. This is the bottle, 114. So they're all, they're all numbered. Exa exactly. Yeah. And the first, uh, depend of the years, uh, depend of the production, mm -hmm. every Two, three hundred uh, bottle. I don't sell. I keep. Uh, keep them here. Yes, for uh, for testing, for, for vertical future. testing. And yeah. now, now we have a ten vintage available in the cellar. That's terrific. Yeah, this is. Uh, I, I'm very happy for this. Uh, it's a good every, day. every vintage is a different yeah. wine, different uh, evolution. You get to be creative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm very happy for this. Uh, is uh, put uh, a little part of my art in the in the in the wine uh, and uh, this is uh, fantastic for the is the testing every year's different life evolution in the wine Beautiful. is uh, is very very interesting as experiment for me <laughs> well I, I appreciate so much you showing us everything it's been thank very you. very informative <laughs> so thanks thank for you inviting very us in. thank you very <laughs> much very, very pleasure. <laughs> yes. there's a good reason why barolos are revered throughout the winemaking world and Paolo Manzoni is someone who knows how to craft these wines to take this Nebbiolo grape and get it into the bottle and get it to you in very powerful and beautiful ways. What are you actually looking for or tasting for when you're tasting a wine? When I taste a wine, uh, for me, is a, a three-part, really, really quick. Uh, process where I look at the wine and I just see if uh, what the color is or mm -hmm. the light and uh, what can I get from uh, from my eyes. Then I smell it and just want to pick out one or two flavors that stand out. Mm -hmm. And then when I taste, I try to swirl it around my mouth to see what the reaction is, and then um, I swallow. And so I go eyes, nose, and mouth. Okay, so now that. That rituals happen, you know, through the smelling and, the, and looking at the color and uh, feeling the texture in the mouth, etc. What am I actually tasting for? I hear people say, "Oh, it hits the mid palate a certain way." Uh, they're maybe looking for specific flavors in the wine. Uh, what's that about? Yes, so uh, the mouth is a very complex um, part of our body. Uh, we have a lot of taste buds, and so it reacts really quick and immediately to flavors and and uh, things that we put in. I divide usually the mouth in three parts. You have the front of your palate where you lips, touch the wine right away, so you're testing right away for temperature, you're testing sometimes for thickness, for fruit, and then the wine in the middle of your mouth, in the mid palate, is where it either opens up and you are tasting the fruit, the sugar, and those components, sometimes the tannins attaches the side of your mouth, mm -hmm. and then you have the back palate that is usually you're testing for acidity and you're testing for the finish. My grandfather was always telling me, like, you test the wine mm -hmm. depending on how far it goes down your throat. The farther it goes down, the better the wine is. Mm -hmm. And that was another way of saying that the last part of your mouth, it kind of tests the, uh, the length and the strength of the wine. This brings to a close episode six of Wine Revealed. Really appreciate being with you during this entire experience and want to remind you that you can and should own Wine Revealed. There's a lot of phenomenal content here. You can revisit it over and over again and keep getting new things out of it. And during our free viewing period, it is steeply discounted. We have multiple packages. So just click the button on this page. It will tell you what packages are there, what the discounts are, and what bonuses that you can get with those packages. Again, appreciate you, appreciate your time and taking this journey with me, and I'll see you in episode seven.
the king of Francia Corta is Chardonnay. Chardonnay is the most important grape of this land and is the grape that identifies the taste of Francia Corta. That is for the characteristic of the grape, but also of the characteristic of the soil of Francia Corta. So you can identify the quality and the taste of Francia Corta. Not many people know that Verona is one of the biggest production area in wine, mm -hmm. having six different appellations where you go from white wines, uh, Soave, Custoza and Lugana, mm -hmm. to red wines like uh, Bardolino and Valpolicella. So mm -hmm. if we put all of them together, it's really one of the biggest city in great production. Consider that 100 years ago, there were 56 different varieties of Lambrusco. Wow. Each one being completely different one from the other. Now the growers in the last decades developed the best, uh, I would say, six, seven varieties. And they are completely different. Thanks so much for being here and watching that video. And can I ask you to please subscribe to our channel so you can find out when we're posting new content. You'll be alerted right away when we do. To share this with people you think might benefit from the information. And certainly it helps us if you like the video. So if you like what you just saw, go ahead and hit that like button. And again, thank you so much for being here with me right now.